So Charlie said that this is the wild crowd. So I want to hear how wild y'all can get. Good morning. So I got it. That, see, that's what I'm talking about. That makes me feel like I'm at home. I don't know who that was, but I'm, I feel like I'm home. A um, couple things real quick before I get into the message today. Um, Charlie, you started a church on April 1st. I did something even crazier on April 1st. I asked my wife to marry her. Uh, if she would marry me, and I got on bed and knee, and the first words out of her mouth were not yes, they were, are you for real? And so, um, and something he's not telling you in reference to uh, us going to high school together, we were baseball buddies, um, he played shortstop, I was the guy that would try to chase down his balls as he was throwing them first base, but he was also, so he, t- literally, a guy walked up to me first service, and he said, man, I heard Charlie was the best guy on your team. You had to hear that from Charlie. And so, because we knew I was. And so, um, no, but what, see, we called him Chaplain Charlie. What, y'all call him pastor around here, right? We just knew him as Chaplain Charlie because he constantly told people in our school about the love of Christ. And I was one. He invited a whole baseball team to go to a Heightstown. It's called Heightstown Church of God, right? And we were going to watch a movie called Years of the Beast. And it was about the rapture, and it was all this scary crap going on, and it scared the hell out of me. Like, when I say literally, like, I asked Christ to be my Savior that night. I ran up to the front of the altar. I did not want to go. I did not want to be left behind. This is long before all those little scary books. And so I owe my, my faith to a guy like Charlie. And a lot of you guys do, this, do the same. Twelve years ago, him and Gina had a dream to plant a church called Gateway. And I'm a church planter, so I don't understand what it's like. It's a tough, tough, tough road. There's lots of sleepless nights. There's lots of visits to the hospital because you're the only one that can do them because you don't have a staff at some points of your church life. And I think it would be absolutely appropriate on the 12th anniversary for you guys to go crazy for Pastor Charlie and Gina right now and just tell them thank you for everything they've done. So that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. All right, we're done. I got to preach. I bet him $50 you wouldn't stand up. Guess who won? No. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, you know, the one things I've always loved about um, Pastor is the fact that he was a dreamer. And 12 years ago, he had a dream. 15 years ago, uh, we had a dream on the beach of Hilton Head about starting a church that would be for normal people. Um, okay, semi-normal. Um, but because our community was is the birthplace of the Southern Baptist Convention, so it was suits and ties, and that's what you wore to church, and, and we decided we were going to have a, we were going to start a church that normal people that can come in shorts and flip-flops and wear jeans or whatever, hey, you got shorts and flip-flops on, you would feel at home at Journey, and so we, we, we started, so I understand the dream, and it made me think about, um, anybody remember when you were a, a kid, it's going to take a little bit longer for some of you to get back that far, but like when you were little, and um, you used to sit, like for me and my brother, uh, we had bunk beds, and, but our bunk beds became way more than just beds. It was way more than the place we slept. It became a race car at times. You ever remember those moments? Like it was a nobody. Uh, and, and, and who's this guy from Georgia? And um, so it, mine became a race car. And, and, and I would become Dale Earnhardt, not Junior, but <laughs> somebody likes Dale Earnhardt. So it became, and I would ring all that. Uh, the Olympics were big when I was growing up, and it would become a swimming pool, and I would be swimming laps, or, you know, for other, other times, it was like, it was, it was the, I know you guys are sophisticated, pastor told me you guys are sophisticated, because you may not even know what I'm talking about, but, but for me, it became a place where we did, I hate to even tell you, that, wrestling, we did wrestling, and we were professional wrestlers, and like, I was Chief J. Strongo, my, my brother, we put on our tidy whities and We'd jump off the top. Bottom. And I, I would, there was times where I would put a towel in my, my shirt and I'd be Superman. You remember? And, and we would dream about all the things that we wanted to be when we were growing up. And then something happened, maybe when we were 17 or 18 or 19 years old, or maybe it was a little older for other people. All of a sudden, something happened. And you know what happened? We stopped dreaming. It made me think, why do we stop dreaming? Is it because all of a sudden we have obligations, we have bills to pay, we have kids growing up? And then all of a sudden, we look back at our lives, we look back at the 30 or 40 years or 50 years or 60 years in some of our cases, we look back and we go, when's the last time I dreamed? And we all, every person in this room, 
has an enemy to the dream that God's given us. Um, this church over the last 12 years has had enemies that come, not, not persons, just things that have come against it, finances, you know, struggles with buildings. It, it happens in our lives. And it made me think over the last couple of weeks just about some of the, the dreams and the reason I stopped dreaming. And maybe you can kind of relate to some. Sometimes we stop dreaming because of fear. Like we're afraid. We're afraid to kind of put it out there. We're, we're afraid of what's happening in the world. I mean, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to pick up, you know, you know jump on lines somewhere and Everything seems to be bad, so fear lead us, leads us down a road. The economy is uncertain. I, I don't know about your community, but we're a, we're a big um, uh, community for military. And so lots of our people, after they retire, they go work at a place called SRS, which is a nuclear site, or, or Plant Vogel, which is another nuclear. Well, they're shutting them down, and hundreds of thousands of people are being and lo- losing their jobs. So the dreams are being dashed. And, and for our lives, maybe it's the fear of you know, sickness, or maybe it's the fear of losing a bit, whatever, a fear of... A, you know, just you know, a spouse, just whatever the fear is. And so fear sometimes keeps us from dreaming. And then there's this whole concept of escapism. We, we look for ways to escape. We try to run from the bad economy. We try to, you know, run from a bad marriage. And we just want to move our toothbrush from one toothbrush, toothbrush holder to another. And we feel like maybe somehow or another that will be better. We try to, you know, run from a stressful situation. And we think if we get enough, enough distance, and this is a huge lie, by the way, if we get enough distance from our troubles, that the, somehow or another they won't be there anymore. And what I found out personally, those troubles will follow you everywhere you go. And some people, and probably not in this church, but I know in our church, you know, some people escape by drinking you know, or doing drugs. And one of the things that we're most proud of is also one of the things that's the most saddest in our community is we have a large uh, group of people that use a organization or a program we have in our church called Celebrate Recovery. And it's interesting and and because people are trying to escape all their struggles and all their problems. And, you know, maybe it's not that for you. Maybe it's eating. Like, like I, I can't pass by a McDonald's and not get a French fry and a vanilla milkshake. You know, it's just like, that's my escape. That's how I escape from life. You know, whatever that is. Maybe, maybe it's denial. Maybe, maybe you just don't think you have a problem. Maybe, maybe if you don't think you have a problem long enough, it won't be there when you, you wake up the next morning. And so we deny that it's even happening. And sometimes it just ends up that we quit. We just quit dreaming. We stop dreaming altogether. And for some strange reason, maybe that's what happens. We just decide that it's, it's so bad, that everything out there is so bad, that we're, just, we're not even going to think through, we're not even going to dream. And then this is the worst of all, is the hopelessness. And just where you feel like nobody cares about you. And I, I shared the same message, or parts of this message at our church about two months ago. And I remember saying this line, it's sad when people don't believe in you. But it's really sad when you think that God doesn't believe in you anymore. And the hopelessness that you don't even feel like God cares about your struggles, your marriage, your problems. And so all of a sudden, all those things take us down a road. And no wonder people run and escape. No wonder they, 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 they kind of sweep their problems under the, underneath the rug. It's because we don't have and we don't seem to have any hope. And today what I'd love to do, if you just give me a few minutes. He, Pastor Charlie told me I had, I had two and a half hours to preach this message. So I've got 68 points. Okay, 68 points. Is that okay with you guys? I promise it'll be mostly good, and so we'll get to a part where if, if it's not good, just kind of shake your head, and it's not good. You, if you do me the favor, just look at me and go, it's like, you, you suck. Just get off the stage right now. Okay, okay, good. So, so this is what I want to do. So, so when, when we're tired and we're fatigued and problems are drowning out our dreams, what do we do? How do we as human beings handle this? And if you're taking notes... Um, I want you to write some notes down. I want you to write these big headlines. And if you have a Bible, uh, I'm going to land right now, and I'm going to head to another scripture in a minute, but Isaiah chapter 40. So if you have an analog Bible, that's the ones that you open up. Um, You can turn to Isaiah 40. If you don't, this is a really cool thing about Gateway. It's a really cool thing about Journey is we value people that maybe don't have a Bible or never read a Bible, and so it's going to be on the back screen in a minute. And so you can just follow along with us. But I, I want to kind of share something real quick because uh, I, I want everybody to get this one concept. Understand God, okay, God, big God, big G, right? Understand God hasn't given up on us or our dreams, so why have we? And so many times what I see happens is we give up on our dreams and God's still trying to poke and prod us. And God's going, listen, I believe in you, I see you. You know, you, you know the, like, like he who began a good work and you was able to complete it, but we don't even believe in ourselves, and we struggle with all that kind of thing. We, we wonder if God's just forgot about us. And several times over the last year, we have felt that way as a couple. And not like in our relationship, which is really, really good now that our kids are out of our house. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, 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 right? I mean, it's amazing. You feel like you got a raise. 
because they're not on your payroll anymore. I mean, it's amazing. But we decided, um, back in August, we decided that we, we want to become extravagant generosity, uh, extravagant givers. And it's one of the things that, so in order to do that and provide, uh, do some things that we want to do with our money and support missions the way we support missions, that we were going to downsize our house. So we're going to move from, it's a nice house. It's not like an opulent house. Um, it's a nice house. It's, you know, it's a normal house. 300,000, you know, in our area, that's just a kind of a normal house. And so we decided we were going to downsize. And so we put the house on the market in August. And when we put the house on the market, we felt like God spoke to us that, that he was going to provide everything. So, so I felt like that meant when God told me that he was going to supply everything, that, that meant the house was going to have a contract the next morning. Anybody else ever had that kind of, or like, anybody ever had like, God make, makes you a promise and you feel like it's got to happen the next morning, and then when it doesn't happen for a week or so, you feel like, oh, where, where were you at, God? Did you lie to me, God? And so the next morning, I wake up, and we have a showing, and I text um, David Green, my real estate, and I, hey, is it, is it sold yet? And he's like, dude, they just looked at the house like two seconds ago. And I'm going, what do you mean? Like, it's supposed to be sold. And that was in August, and then September came. And we had a couple showings, and we got a contract. And two days later after the contract, they pulled the contract out from underneath us. From that time right there to December, we had three contracts that fell through. And every month we're going, God, are you sure you're talking? Like, like I thought I heard, I thought I, thought I heard you saying that this was the, like, we're going to do everything we can. We want to honor you with our, with our lives. In the last third of our lives, we want to be the best we can possibly be. God, come on. In the process of this, we found the perfect house that we wanted to move in. We have a couple in our church um, that are the Chip and Joanne of Augusta. So, so you guys watch that show, right? Isn't that the coolest show in the whole world? And he loves John Bon Jovi. So, like, I got a man crush on Chip now. And so it's one of those deals where, but, so, they're the, so we, 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 she, she designs everything on the inside. The color schemes. I found out there's this wood called shiplap. It's amazing. And we were going to have these things called subway tiles in the bathroom. There's these really cool, like, like I really don't care about them. She loved them, so I loved them. And we were going to have a blue door. And in the process of this, our house wasn't selling. So right before Christmas, this past, just this past year, um, I called Trey and I said, Hey, Trey, I know it's not selling. And I know you got to turn money around. I mean, this is what you do for a living. Just know that we understand that you may have to sell the house. And he said, let's just wait until after the holidays. And I said, okay, we'll wait until after the holidays. So we wait until January. And January 3rd, I called him. I said, hey, what's the deal? And he goes, hey, I got to put the house for sale. And I'm like, I understand. It's going to happen. The house sold the next day, never on the market, for $75,000 more than we were going to pay. And I was crushed. As a man, any men, men in the room? Okay, some of you need to raise your hand like, <laughs> where is he going with this? One of the things that I think God has put inside of us is to provide for our spouses. And I felt like I couldn't give my wife what she deserved. And so I was, beat up, I was beating myself up. I felt like God had forgotten me. I felt like God had all, little did I know. See, this is what happens in our lives. So many times, we're over here telling God, would you join us over here? We're over here. We want to sell this house, and we want to buy this other house. And God is way over here. i got to remember there's a camera back there. He's way over here. And he's going, no, no, God. Hey, Bobby, I'm over here, and I want you to join me over here. And I'm trying to get God way over here. I'm going, hey, God, but we want to do it this way. And he's going way over here. He's going, i got a better plan if you'll just come this way. The whole time I'm over there, and I'm frustrated, and I can't figure out what God's trying to do or what, he, what, he, what he's even, you know, trying to accomplish in my life. So we sold, they sold the other house. A few days later, guess what we get on the house? A contract. And I'm mad. I think I cussed at God, which I don't think preachers should do. But it was one of those deals where, like, come on, God. And God goes... Would you just join with me over here? I got something better for you way over here. I got bigger dreams way over here than your little small measly dreams over there. If you would just come join me. And you know what happened? The house next door to the house that we were going to buy, which is a bigger house, which is a ni nicer house, which has a four-car garage, which is, I mean, gazormous. I mean, it's like huge. Gets sold to the people, to Chip and Diane. And they said, hey, we want to bless you, and we want to give you this house at a discounted price. And I'm like, tail between my legs, I'm coming over to where you are, God. 
don't tell me you've never felt that way. Don't tell me you've never struggled with the concept that you felt like God has forgotten you. It's been going on since the beginning of time. Isaiah chapter 40, this is what Jacob says. He says, oh, Jacob, or said to Jacob, oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? So Israel is going through it thousands of years ago, the same thing that we go through right now. And then in verse 28, it says, and this is the familiar passage that a lot of us have heard in church before. And if you've never been to church, we're going to break it down a little bit. But it says, have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak and he never grows weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. You know what it's saying? He never gets tired of you. He never gets tired of you being over here and him trying to draw you over here. And so many times in our lives we feel like, man, I failed again and I failed again and I failed again and I failed again. And God wants nothing to do with it. He's going, I, I'm not tired of you yet. I'll never grow weary. I'll never grow tired. So come over here. So he's never tired of your person. He's never, he's never tired of our sin. He's never tired. He, he, you want a really big revelation? He kind of knew you were going to keep on sinning. Did y'all know that? Like he, 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 he knew. That's why we have grace, unmer unmerited favor, because we need that because we keep falling. So he's not afraid of that. He's not afraid uh, of, of losing you that way. But he's also not afraid of our circumstances. I have people walk in my office all the time, and they are hopeless when it comes to their marriage. They're hopeless when it comes to an addiction. And I'll say, listen, you are not freaking God out. God knew this was going to happen. God, God knew that, 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 that grace was going to be needed, you know, given to you. He knew it. So he hasn't given us something. He's not. Hey, man, he's like, he is not afraid of us failing. When it comes to your progress, when it comes to my progress, our success, our holiness, God will never grow tired, never grow weary. He hasn't given up on us. Read verse 28. I'm going to read the last portion of this because it's really powerful. Have you never heard, have you never understood the Lord is an everlasting God? The creator of all the earth, he, he never grows weak or weary. Watch this. No one, no one can measure the depths of his understanding. This is what he's saying here. I understand things when you don't understand them. I understand things. I'm the, I'm the God. Let me, here's, you want a big secret? You're not God. So many times in our lives we try to play God, don't we? we I'm going to arrange this a certain way. So if we're going to get back to dreaming, that means we're going to have to understand that God has not given up on us and God has not given up on our dreams. So how, however ridiculous they may, may, may seem, businesses or ministries or church, whatever it is, that God has not given up on us. God has not given up. It's, it's interesting because one of the things that I've learned, and this is a key element to this, and I promise you the next 38 points are not as long as this one point, okay? But what happens in our lives so many times is we don't know our limits. Like we, 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 like, like we live like, no fear, no fear. We don't know our limits. And we have to, and the Bible says this in verse 29. He says, he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall. In exhaustion. That means there's a limit. There's a limit. And that's what happens. We get above our limit. We get, we get burnt out. We get tired. And all of a sudden, we can't dream anymore. Um, back in the 19th century, the insurance companies, and I, I, grew, I was an insurance agent for a while, insurance companies in the 1900s um, started selling insurance on property. And so one of the things that they would insure is boats. And so all these merchants would be dri you know, driving. They were driving. They were uh, sailing across the seas with all all their, all their goods, all their whatever merchandise that they were selling, whether spices or, and they would go across. Well, when the insurance came around, the people realized, the owners of these boats realized that they could make more money by sinking the boats and the people on them as opposed to paying the product to be shipped across seas. So they would overload the product onto the boat. And, and there was a guy, and it was interesting because um, his name was Samuel uh, Plimsoll. He decided that he was going to fight because he realized they called them, they called them coffin ships. Because any time they set out, they knew that the this, this ship was going to sink and people would die. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of, of sailors died. And so he goes to Parliament. And, and he goes to Parliament and he's fighting. He says, I'm going to fight everything. He's, in 1873, Parliament decided to put, a, 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 issued a decree, a law that said that they couldn't do this anymore. And so what they did was they said, we're going to have a limit to how much you can put on the boat. And the limit's going to be demonstrated by a line that goes down the side of the boat. As a matter of fact, if you look at boats right now, if you go down to any harbor, there's a line on the sides of the boat. It's called the Plimsoll line. And what happens is when it gets to that point or below, that means there's too much weight on the boat. It was started out as a safety, and now it's just a thing that all the boats do. Do you know what we need to have in our lives? Even you grow tired. 
Even, even you stop dreaming. Even people that are, you know, crazy wild and have, you know, wild eyes, they still get tired. You know why? Because we go above or below that plimsoll line. I, I read a book just recently, and it's by a gentleman by the name of Richard Swenson. The book's called The Overload Syndrome. And listen to what he says. It, it's brilliant. We are exceeding our limits in scores of areas all at the same time. Now, listen, think about your own personal life. Like, just think about where you're at, Okay. We are exceeding our limits in scores of areas, uh, of all the areas of our lives at the same time. From activity overload, I have a, I have a person that came to, up to me in church two weeks ago and said, one of their ch- children, one child, plays on five different baseball teams. They had three games in one night, plus they have two daughters that play lacrosse. They had two games apiece. They played on different lacrosse teams. Could you imagine that? And we wonder why we're burned out, and we wonder why we don't have time to dream. So that's just one, from activity overload to choice overload to debt overload to expectation overload to information overload to work overload. We are a piled on margins society. We all need in our lives to paint a line that says this is, this is it. We can't do any more because you know who gets, gets the short end of the stick on this? God. God's the one who gets the short end of the stick on it. So we're going to do all these other activities, and we're going to put God way back here. So that's the first point. Here's my second thing. I'm going to fly through the next two. What time do we have to be done, Charlie? 12.15? You sure? Get along with God. Get along with God. Get along with God to refuel your That's the only way it happens. There's a story of a guy. He's a prophet, Elijah. And Elijah is, is just a man of God. He's prophesying. But we find him in 1 Kings after all these great things happen. And I'm talking about prophets of Baal, 400, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. We find him running from one woman. That's all I'm going to say about that. And, the, and in chapter 19, he's underneath a broom tree and he's asking God to kill him. He said, God, I would rather be dead than where I'm at right now. Now watch this. This is really cool. In 1 Kings chapter 19, 11, it says this. He says, go, go out and stand before um, me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And, and as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by a mighty windstorm in the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. The Lord was not in the wind. And after there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. And after the fire, he was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face around his cloak and he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave. You know what we got to do? We got to stop looking for God in all the activities that we do, even church activities. We spend so much time. We are so overchurched. We're so we're so overchurched sometimes that we're under challenged to do what God's called us to do in the world that we live in. I, I, it drives me nuts. I love the last song we did today is actually a Bethel song. I love Bethel. We're actually doing that song on Easter Sunday. I love Bethel music. You know, but we have people that the only time they get charged up is when they run to a Bethel con- concert. Or the only time they get charged up is when you, you're a youth pastor, right? I'm a recovering youth pastor. You're a recovering youth pastor. So one of the things that used to drive me nuts as a youth pastor is we would do youth camps. And we would have the same kids get saved every youth camp. They would run up and they would run up and they would be all excited. The, the, the cries and tears and, you know, boogers, slime, you know, all that stuff was happening. But the next year, you know what happened the next year? The same kids would come up. And at some point, we have to stop living in the activities. He wasn't in the firestorm. He wasn't in the windstorm. And he wasn't in, in, you know, in the tornado. He wasn't in any of that stuff. He was found with a still, small voice. And the problem is we're so busy with activities, even church activities. I'm not trying to steal people from church, okay? But we're so busy that we have failed to remember that on Monday morning, he wants to speak to us. Then on Tuesday morning, and here's a sad truth. Here's a sad truth. I don't have my Bible with me today. No, I don't need it. Some of us haven't picked up our Bibles since last Sunday. It's the first time we picked it up. And the sad truth is, we wonder why we're not dreaming anymore. It's because we're not spending the one time with the one that gives us the dreams. Let me give you the third thing. I'm, a, I'm just going to dive into the third one. Never, ever be afraid, ever be afraid to recalibrate your dreams. There's a time in all of our lives, I was reading a story about um, a guy that, Lost his job, and so he was going to apply for another job. So he's sitting in front of the employer, and the employer said, okay, can you tell me about your last job? He goes, what were you? And he goes, I was a dog catcher for a little small town in Texas. He goes, that's great. He said, would you mind telling me why you lost your job? Was it because of budget cuts or did something happen? He goes, nope. He goes, well, tell me what it was. He goes, well, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you. He goes, well, just tell me what it was. He goes, well, I caught the dog. 
And you know what I'm afraid of in our lives? We catch the dog and we stop dreaming. We have that thing, that idea that, that thought, you know, this is what we're going to do. We get married and we stop chasing after the dream. We caught the dog. Or... What would happen? Nehemiah is a Babylonian slave. And God tells him to build a wall around Jerusalem because the wall had been torn down. He gets to the end of the job. I think it's in chapter 6 or 7 of the book of Nehemiah. He's at the end of the job. He's done. He's kind of sitting there just twiddling his thumbs, kind of like us a little bit. We have accomplished it. We're in retirement, especially with people that are retirement age. I'm not retirement age. I'm way far away from retirement age. But, we, you know, we start twiddling our thumbs. We don't, and he, here's, a, here's a fear. Here's one of the most dangerous places we could possibly be. When we have more memories than we have dreams. Then we're constantly living. Listen to what happens with Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 7 says, At that time the city was large and spacious, but the population was small, and none of the houses had been rebuilt. You catch that? The wall was built, but there was no place for people to live. And this is what happens. And he says in verse 5, So my God gave me an idea. You know what the idea was? Recalibrate your dreams, Nehemiah. The wall's built. Start building houses now. Start having a place where people can dwell. Start developing a strategy where people can come in. So in three minutes, I'm going to give you three big, here, here's what we take home. You ready? I'm going to like, it's going to be fire hydrant. You ready? So here's the first thing. We need to make sure that our dreams are big enough that you can't do them by yourself. If you can do the dream by yourself, it's not big enough. If you can do it in one year, it's not big enough. If you can do, if you can do it, if you can accomplish, there, there's no giants that you can accomplish by yourself. You can't build boats by yourself. You can't cross Red Seas by yourself. You've got to have God's help. And if you don't need God, it's not a God-sized dream. What are you going to do with that? Try something bigger and don't be afraid to fail. So that's the first thing. The second thing is never, ever give up on your dream. Never give up on your dream, regardless of what it looks like. Anybody know who Walt Disney is? Anybody ever been to Disney World? If you haven't been, you need to go. So Disney was one of my favorite because he's, he's such a visionary. But he was sitting there one day, and he was working for a newspaper, and he gets fired from the newspaper. So most of us, we get fired at a job. It was his dream job, he said, because he was doing illustrations for the cartoons. So he actually has to try to find another job. So he goes and knocks on the door of a, a pastor, a preacher, and he asks if he can live. Does he have a place to live? So he goes, you can live in the parsonage. And so he goes, I'll live in the parsonage. It's not the greatest place. So he goes and he starts living in the parsonage. Every night he's waking up by the sound of mice running all across the room. So he'd flick on the light and all the mice would leave. He started naming the mice. He started naming the mice. Guess what the most famous mouse that he named was? Mickey. Mickey, Mickey Mouse. And from that situation where he should have given up, he could have given up, he actually had an idea that spawned, there was a dream that spawned Disney World. Fast forward, 1979, Walt Disney has died now. Walt Disney's wife is sitting there with a newscaster named Walter Cronkite, and Walter says to Disney's wife, he says, I sure wish Walt could be here to see all this. It was the opening, the grand opening of Disney World. He said, I sure wish this, uh, Walt could be here to see all this. And she turns to him and says, Walter, I want you to know Here's the deal. I want you to know this. If he didn't see it years ago, you wouldn't be sitting here looking at it right now. You wouldn't be sitting here looking at it right now. And so it's, it's one of those, don't give up on your dreams. And now let me give you the last thing, okay? Try something. Dream about something. Not, not you know, I, I, we were sharing last night. Like, dream about something. Just do something bigger than you, whatever that looks like. In Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, he shares a story about a re revolutionary um, warships, and they would shoot bullets because they didn't have enough black powder to put cannonballs, so they would shoot a bullet, and when they shoot a bullet, they realized if they missed, they would recalibrate, and they would recalibrate, and they would recalibrate to the point where they would hit the boat, and they would send the big cannonball. I said this to one of our staff the other day. I don't think God's going to get mad at us if we fail at something. I think the biggest failure is if we don't do anything. What would happen if Gateway, in the next 12 years, shot a few bullets, and then all of a sudden shot a big cannonball. So ours was this. I'm going to close. I'm going to go one minute long. Ours was this. Um, about three years ago, I had a vision, and I shared it with our staff, about online church. And I actually felt like God told me if we didn't do it, we were going to miss a large population of people that could potentially hear the gospel. People like me, that from high school, that needed to hear the gospel. And so we decided to go online. And when I say online, we've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in sharing the love of Jesus, making Jesus famous in our community online. 
because we are a very transient community. People come and go because of Fort, Fort Gordon. And so we, we initially started because of that. Our first Sunday was Easter Sunday three years ago. I don't remember the exact number. It was less than 50. I think I heard somebody say it was 24 people. Well, I just actually texted our, we have an online pastor. He literally is an online pastor. That's all he does. He does online. And I said, how many do we have this morning? He actually preached for me this morning. I said, how many do we have this morning? As of our second service, we had um, 380-something people watching online. We had the first two people gave their life to Jesus this past year online. We had the first two people that were online people that actually got baptized in our church online. And we started the first micro church two weeks ago because of somebody online in Ecuador. His name is Abib. And I challenged Abib. I said, I want you to start a micro church. And he goes, I, he, goes he, speaks, he speaks really broken English. He goes, Dr. Bobby, I don't know what micro church is. That's the sorriest Spanish accent, isn't it? And I said, man, just invite people over to your house to watch this, this service. And he said, what? I said, just, just invite people. Last week, he had over 20 people in his house watching the service, and two people gave their life to Christ. Just do something. It may have to be recalibrated 10 times, but do something for God. What is it for you? What's God calling you to do? What's it look like? What's God calling you to do at Gateway? What's it look like? I was sharing with Charlie last night. We were talking about small group leaders. In order for this church to grow, you know what's going to happen? The foundation's got to grow. There needs to be more people. There needs to be more people that are going to come alongside this great leadership team. What's your responsibility there? What's the dream? Can you attach to somebody's dream? I think God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or imagine when God plants the dream in our lives. Amen? Amen. Somebody say amen this morning. Can we pray together? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this great church. I thank you for my friend and at certain times my pastor, that you would use him in a way to cast vision just like he's casted vision in the last 15 years of my life. And I'm thankful for him. I pray that you would bless. I, I pray that you would bless that family, this family. I pray that you would bless this church. And I pray that we would see, God, just amazing things, that you would do supernatural things through the dreams that come out of this church. I thank you for all that you are. I thank you for all that we can be because of you. In Jesus' name I pray these things. And everybody said, amen. amen. You know, it's, it is, um, it's very surreal having someone you went in high school, when you went to high school with, preach for you on a Sunday morning. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't know what or who put it into my heart back then that the joy that you have is something that you have to share. And that there's, there's someone, without you even knowing it, in your sphere of influence that needs the hope of Christ. And, and in doing so, you really have fulfilled the biggest dream given to all of us. Um, the dream that brought Gene and I and Pastor Harry and Georgetta and Daniel and Nikki Peterson from and Hope and Peter L. from Georgia to Franklin was to develop the most spiritually influential people on the planet. That's the, that's, that's the simple phrase. Is there a way, is there a way that we can get people to understand that God's dream for them is to share him with other people and that we're all wired differently and we all share different arenas in which God's planted us but we all have the same purpose it's what fires you up it's what fuels you when you see someone else discover who you discovered at a certain point in time and that's the dream and that's what we want to rededicate ourselves to today at 12 years old we were going to go outside um, all the plans were to be outside, except for the weatherman's plans. And um, if, I, if I'd have taken the first service out there, we would have all got soaking wet um, before we got it back in. So the elders that are going to come up to pray, you guys come on up. Here's what I want to do. If you do not have a sheet in your hand, raise your hand. If you don't have one of these, everyone have one? No? Others? So other um, ushers, if you guys will make sure the people with their hands raised get one of these sheets. Just keep your hand up if you don't mind until you guys come on up here. 
this is going to read first. So here's, what, here's, here's how this is going to This is really a prayer and the scripture behind the prayer. So the beginning, I'm going to pray. I'm going to read the prayer. And then one of our elders is going to read a verse of scripture. And then what you see on the left in the little block, that's going to be a prayer we pray in unison. Okay? So when I get to the place where I say, Father, together we will, we're going to, re- we're going to pray that all together. You, you're reading it, but it's a prayer. And then one of our elders will read a scripture, and then we're going to pray. So here, I want us all to stand, if you will, since we can't stand up out on the foundation. We're going to stand on this foundation. And I know that, that we have guests, and we just welcome you to pray with us along this. This was the scripture that has driven even the name of our church, is John 10, 9 and 10. I am the gate. I came that you might have life, more and better life than you ever dreamed. That's what God gave me 13 years ago. That there is a, There's more and a better life that he has intended for. He is the good shepherd. That's what this passage is called, the good shepherd. So, to Father, today we gather together on this new foundation. This one's an old one. But for the new one, as one church called Gateway, to rededicate ourselves to the ministry for which God has united us, The prayers we invoke today unify us on the mission to become spiritually influential followers of Christ. Here's the first passage. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. What a reputation Christ had. Let's pray together. Father, together we will welcome the least the last, and the lost. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Let's pray. Father... Empower us to boldly proclaim the good news. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had, who had need. Every, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We live in the most disconnected society that's ever been. A culture longing for true community. This, this community tra- change that happened in Acts 2 drew people. The community, the change among one another drew people to it to hear the message. Let that be us as well. So let's pray. Father, grow us up and grow us together in you. And here's the last passage. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. The harvest field may be harassed and helped. Guarantee you, if I took a survey, every one of you in here could say that there's someone in your life that this is how you would describe them. They, they have this sense of being harassed. They're, they're helpless. They truly are on their own. There's nothing wrong with the harvest field. That's what this passage says. People are ready to receive this message. So our prayer is to fulfill that passage. Here's our prayer. Father, we are your servants. Send all of us. Father, we are your servants. Send all of us. Father, we are 
your people. We are called by your name. Lord, you have set us here. Lord, you've woven some of us together for the last decade, others in the last 10 months, others in the last month. Father, we're yours, set apart for your service. None of us have it all together. You're mending us. But Father, we don't have to wait to have our act together before we reach out to those who need, who need you. So Father, on this day, Lord, as a body, it has this shepherd of this body, Lord, we rededicate ourselves. Lord, that what Pastor Bobby said, Lord, let us have bigger dreams, more dreams than we do memories. It's been a great 12 years. But Lord, let's not have those memories out, pay, out strip and outpass the dreams that you have for us for the next 12 and 20 and 30 years. Lord, we are your servants. Lord, send all of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 If you're a guest with us today, it's been great having you a part of our service today. Would you please express your appreciation to Pastor Bobby and Gina? Um, I, I, I love the chance to go speak for friends, and, um, but it's never easy to go do it. Well, something, something has to get set aside in order for this to be done, and I greatly appreciate it that in our, our decades of friendship. If you are a guest uh, right after the benediction, we'd love to get a, chan a chance to meet you right outside of these double doors. We have a gift for you. It's been a pleasure hosting you today. Now for our benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up, and you're laying down, and you're going out, and you're coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.